Well, good day to everybody. Welcome to another episode of Calmly Considered, the June 2022 episode. We are glad that you are with us. I am Alan Bevere, uh, and I am the self-appointed Anselm Chair of Podcast Theology and Culture of Faith, Seeking Understanding University, where all seekers are welcome to ponder profound things free of charge. And I am pleased to uh, have with me again my conversation partner, Michael Cruz, who is, as I have said before, the incomparable, and he has the fingerprints to prove it, Michael Cruz, who is the Grand Poobah Chair of Economics and Public Theology at FSUU. I need to come up with another introduction for you because I think I've done that now for three months. <laughs> Anyway, but it's true. It's all true. It's true. You are incomparable. Your fingerprints show it. So anyway, right. so, <laughs> it's, it's good to see you again. And good have to see you. I, I, by the way, I just need to say to you uh, that every month I look forward to these conversations. I just find them to be rich. I do too. Yeah. And uh, just thank, thankful for your perspective. So anyway, so uh, before we get into the matter of hand, let me also say, by the way, the background you see is my church office. It is my last time to be uh, recording from my church office at Ashton First United Methodist Church because I am retiring officially tomorrow. My last uh, last day is in the office is tomorrow. Uh, and so uh, come next month, I'll be recording either in the Brain Central of FSUU, which is my study in the basement, no big deal, or from somewhere else. So we'll see. But anyway. I just wanted to say that. And also, for those of you who do listen, uh, I'm going to be stepping up the video cast podcast. So we're going to continue Calmly Considered every month. But uh, we will publish a podcast every month on uh, a different kind of episode. So one month we'll be seeing is believing, in which we'll talk about some kind of aspect of faith. We're also going to do courageous conversations where I will interview somebody on an uh, important subject or matter. And Michael, I might, you know, I was thinking, I'd love to uh, uh, have a conversation with you sometime, maybe in a few months on economics. Uh, sure. I know we've yeah. talked about the issue of scarcity and abundance, but I think we need more, we need more on that. So I may yeah. interview you on that. Uh, and also uh, a monthly uh, uh podcast on the word revisited where we'll talk about something in reference to the biblical text uh, and how uh, it is to be interpreted for contemporary life so that's coming in july just to let you know because i'll be retired i just want to say that by the way all right michael so uh before we get into our subject at hand um uh, Boy, you know, you're a Royals fan. I'm a Guardians fan. Stuff is not going well right now, is it? It, it is not going well. The, the one thing that almost every team in baseball can say right now is at least we're not the Royals. So that, that's. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to use that because I'm not real enamored with the Guardians right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, it, you know. In spite of the in spite of the frustrations, you just can't beat a summer evening at a baseball game, can you? That's right. That's right. Yep. It is. I, I, I mentioned this before. My wife and I have an ongoing battle that will never be resolved in our lifetimes, and that is, I think baseball is the greatest sport ever invented. Yeah. She thinks basketball is. So, ah. Okay. So I, I'll say to her, I said, well, you know, some at some point we'll all be, both of us will be dead and we'll be in the kingdom and you'll know I'm right. So, <laughs> the, the truth will come out in the end. That's the truth right. will set you free. That's right. So anyway. Yeah. All this right. Baseball's let's... the best. I, I, I think it's somewhere in the original Greek in the New Testament. It's, baseball it's, is exactly right. Right. it's somewhere in the original Greek. I love it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's, uh, the matter at hand is gun violence in America. So uh, you and I had a little conversation before we did this, and you said, and I'm with you, is that we're not really experts in all things gun, guns in America, but right. we are readers, we work through things, we think about things, and so that's, you know, I want to work through that. So I, uh, I want to begin first with explaining our position on guns. Okay, so I'm going to start and you can you can follow up. So I'm not a gun owner. 
Uh, it's not because I've got an aversion to guns. I just, I just felt over the years that if I owned a gun, uh, the first casualty of my gun would be me. <laughs> yes. And uh, I, I've just never, you know, I'm not a hunter. Uh, I, I've never been interested in hunting. Uh, not that I've got friends who hunt and they actually uh, uh, sometimes give me a deer roast, which I have to say is pretty good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But I'm not a hunter. Uh, I love fishing, but if, if you in Ohio, it's illegal to shoot a fish. With a fish. <laughs> uh, but I don't, you know, I've never, I, you know, I do not care if uh, if people who are sane and rational have guns. Uh, I've got two neighbors, uh, one on one side of me who I am very comfortable. I know he has a couple of guns. I think he's a great guy. I have no objection to him having a gun. The guy on the other side of me, I'm not too sure about. And yes. I also know he has guns, but you know, whatever. Um, so I am not, I am not a person who wants to uh, take away everybody's guns. Okay, that's not me. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I am for sensible legislation and we'll talk more about that. So that's my position. Anyway, Michael, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, I also do not own a gun, never have, um, I've owned some old guns that don't work that my great grandfather had, but I don't own any operational guns. Um, I think my first experience with guns was as a, as a young guy who got to go out to a farm with some friends and, and shoot guns. And I've done that a few times. In fact, one of the things I learned shooting a 22 rifle is that I am, I, I knew I was right-handed, but I also learned that I am left eye dominant. And what that means is your left, one of your eyes is focused on distance. The other one is for, for close in. And so if you're left eye dominant and right handed, you're always going to be off on the target. You either need to close one eye, close your, your left eye to aim, or you need to move and shoot left handed. So uh, I learned I learned that through shooting my 22 rifle uh, uh, about that. But I, I got I enjoyed target practice and, and some of those kind of things, trying to shoot targets. Um, it has never been, I mean, uh, for all the other things I could be doing, it is not high on my priorities. Nothing that has ever really been that that great of an interest for me. Um, and I have known people who very much uh, enjoy guns and, and shooting guns and, and uh, collecting, you know, that type of thing. Um, so I, like you, I have no opposition to the, the general idea of owning guns, but from a societal systemic level, I do think that it shows that there needs to be safeguards put around how guns are used in society and um, how we work for the health of society with guns in our presence. We'll get into some of these details yeah. later, but when you look at the gun culture in the United States versus gun cultures in other countries that have the same level of gun ownership that we've got, um, it, is, it is a vastly different world. So. Yeah. I think that that's more where uh, my concern is. The other issue is too, we have in the constitution, there's the second amendment. It's a awkwardly worded amendment and open to varieties of interpretations, but it does seem to, at least as the Supreme Court has ruled that it, uh, it does seem to imply that people do have a right to, to uh, have a firearm. Yeah. But as we know, and we'll get into this too, no, none of the rights in the Bill of Rights are absolute rights. There, there are curbs on all of them in some way. Yeah. So let's talk about the Second Amendment. Um, let me read the Second Amendment to you. Uh, it says, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. All right. Right. Now, let me say one thing. I know that there are people on the left who feel that that only refers to a militia, meaning, I, right. I guess, in our context, the National Guard. Right. Uh, and people on the right believe that applies to uh, personal ownership. One of the right. things uh, that I've thought about is that in the 18th century, when this was written, uh, pe members who were people who were members of a militia in a town brought their gun, <laughs> yeah. meaning they had their gun. So to right. say that um, guns should be held by the militia, National Guard, is not really what they had in mind. 
Right. The Supreme Court has ruled, and I know there are people who disagree with that, that individuals can own guns. Uh, that's not going to change until we have a different Supreme Court, obviously. Or a constitutional uh, amendment. May not. Which, may which not is not going to happen either. Yeah, right. And so. by the way, I also want to say to people that you know, we need to understand that it's not just right-wing Republicans who believe in the Second Amendment. There are plenty of Democrats out there. Right. Who believe that it's okay for people to own guns. In fact, Bernie Sanders, of all people, Mr. Vermont, <laughs> uh, <laughs> argued in the last presidential election that, you know, people should be able to own guns because he lives in Vermont. Right. So, I mean, one of the things I think about here is now, by the way, I also will say the Supreme Court has ruled and Antonin Scalia. The late, late member of the Supreme Court argued that even though we have the right to bear arms, the government can limit what arms we own. I mean, that was right. his argument. Yeah. So, right. so where does the Second Amendment leave us? Because here's my here's my thought, and I'll let you comment on this. Mm -hmm. My thought is the Second Amendment doesn't really help us much. It certainly is not clear. It's not a well written amendment, and so it leaves it open to all sorts of interpretation like as you were just noting that varying degrees of legitimacy can be granted to those interpretations so yeah i don't know exactly where it leaves us and i'm not a lawyer a constitutional yeah. lawyer so i i would presume to make it a definitive statement as to to what it means but i do think what it it at least means is compared to most other countries around the world i think the united states and maybe a couple other countries actually have it something in their constitution about in some way, in some form, uh, citizens having a right to own uh, to own guns. Right. So, I, I, so that makes us a little unusual, and it, and it certainly shades the debate as to what can be done legislatively in terms of addressing gun issues. Yeah. Would you agree with me when I say that America has a gun violence problem? Yes, definitely. Um, when, statistically, when you look uh, at, for instance, just the, the gun deaths, uh, deaths by gun, either for homicide or suicide, the United States exceeds uh, the rates in other developed nations like uh, Western Europe, the European Union, that's, I think, by factors of five to 10 times greater uh, than those countries. Now, the United States is considerably better off than, say, some Latin American countries. Uh, some some countries in Africa, that type of thing, there are, the United States is better off than those, but for countries with the level of um, economic development, of social institutions that we, we supposedly have, democracy and that type of thing, we are far above the others. So there's obviously something different about the American milieu than there is elsewhere. Yeah, is it a compliment to say we're above banana republics? <laughs> yeah, I mean seriously. Right. Well, we were uh, joking about baseball earlier. It's like being a team that's ten games under five hundred, saying, "Well, at least we're not the Royals." Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> it's uh, that that's that's not very good. Uh, uh, you know, not the kind of claim that you want to be able to make. You want to yeah, be up no, the top, listen, and we're not. Yeah. Yeah, so. I'm with you on that. Um, you know. Um, I'm, you know, one of the things that bothers me about this conversation is how many people I know completely ignore the, what I would say, good results that other countries have had in reference to gun legislation, Australia, Britain, uh, Germany, and other places where guns are not completely illegal, right? Uh, Canada, uh, but there are restrictions on gun ownership and, uh, you know, I, I mean, I have, I got, I have friends who say, well, it doesn't work. I'm thinking, well, yes, it does. We've shown it works in other countries. What's the problem here? So what's going right. on? Well, and I, I think also with that argument, the idea is you, a law is proposed and you say, well, that law is not going to stop gun violence. This type of things, it's going to keep, it's going to keep happening. It may keep happening, but it may happen at a lower rate. And it's, it's a web of things that can end up bringing things down to a manageable number. 
yes, all those countries that have those laws still have gun violence. They still have murders that happen with guns. They still have suicides that happens with guns, but they happen at far lower rates. So the idea, it, it's like saying there's no reason to put uh, locks on my front door because somebody could just break in through the window. Yeah. Well, putting lock on my front door is one deterrent. It, 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 it lessens the chances. It doesn't stop it from happening altogether, but it lessens the chances of it happening. So there are things that we can do that, that lessen that, that like, likelihood. Yeah, to me, it's making the perfect the enemy of the good. And, yeah. and it becomes uh, a distraction. Right. Um, oh, I'm so half tempted to get into another question, but we're not quite there yet. Okay. <laughs> um. I struggle. I struggle. I, you know, I don't have, again, I don't have an objection to people who own guns. I have friends who own guns. I, I don't right. have a problem with it. But it seems to me sometimes that for some people, it almost is an obsession. Yeah. And, and I don't, I'm trying to understand it. By the way, we could be obsessed about a lot of different things. I know people who are obsessed with golf. Yeah. <laughs> Right, I, know, right. I don't know why, but they're obsessed. <laughs> I know people who are obsessed with other issues. It's not an issue of enjoying something or liking it. It's an issue of being completely obsessed with it. And what I see, I mean, I've got to tell you, you know, Mike DeWine here, our governor in Ohio, has now signed a law uh, reducing teacher training for guns uh, using holding carrying guns for 24 hours of training we now in ohio you can carry a gun without a permit i mean you don't even need a permit you don't need training you can do you know and i'm like okay here's here's bavir's thought this is no longer about the second amendment yeah. this is about gun ownership as a fetish yeah. um you know and and by the way let me say this uh, by the way i want to say it's idolatry now, yeah. nobody in the Bible, in the Old Testament, when you see the prophets and what they say, nobody says, yes, we're idolaters. You who? <laughs> nobody does that. Right. Idolatry is something that has to be pointed out to people who deny it. Okay. Right. Yeah. So it's one thing to say, I own a gun. I'm glad I own a gun. I like to hunt. I like to target practice. I want a gun on, in my nightspan, uh, nightstand for protection. Okay. I'm good with that. But some of this stuff is just bordering on obsession. Yeah. What do you think? I, I agree. I, when I think back to my childhood into early adulthood, um, I don't recall this whole idea of sort of gun culture being such a central thing for people. I don't know exactly where or when the, the exact change occurred. It feels to me like sometime in the 1990s, maybe. It could have been earlier, could have been a little later. I'm not sure. But it is it has become it, it's not just a policy issue, it is an identity issue. Yeah. It, it's it's um your statements on what you think about guns and your commitment to that becomes a a badge that you wear on your sleeve that says you're part of a particular identity group. And so to some degree, with some people debating the merits of guns or gun control is irrelevant to why they're holding the position. They, it, they have not reasoned themselves into the position and you can't reason them out of the position because it's an identity issue, not, not, and, a, yeah. not a policy issue. Yeah. And, and some of that, um, for example, um, I have a friend uh, who owns guns uh, and when Barack Obama was elected president in 2008, he went out and bought more guns because, yeah. because he was going to take our guns. Yeah. <laughs> and I always want to say to my friends who are gun owners who do this, I say, you know, when Barack Obama was president for eight years, did you lose your guns? Yeah. You know, now that uh, Joe Biden is president, have you lost your guns? Yeah. Uh, the reality is uh, we're a gun society. I don't know how else to say that. People are going to be owning guns. Um, and, and, you know, you, you don't have to worry about the government taking your firearms because it's just not going to happen. And yet, every time we have an issue, people go out and buy more guns and ammo. We, I mean, I was reading a statistic. We've got more guns per person in the United States than any other country. I mean, not just 
it's like 350 guns per person. Yeah, <laughs> like, right. Yeah, yeah. It's it's sort of like how many nuclear weapons do we have, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. It, after a while, it gets to be insane, and yet we've got people in a panic that the government's gonna take their guns when we have absolutely no evidence that it certainly won't happen in our lifetime. I can't right. speak for the future, but it won't happen in our lifetime. Well, um, and, and I think, thinking on that a little bit further too, the rationale, you know, the, your, your friend you're talking about went out and bought guns because Barack Obama got elected and they're gonna, they're gonna come take our guns. If the United States government wanted to take over, you know, military, occupation of the United States, do you really think individual citizens owning guns is going to be able to stop the military of the United yeah. States? Of course it isn't. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's just it's silly. Yeah. And, and, and by the flip side of that is, do you think that the United States government cares one way or the other if the citizens have guns, if its intention is to militarily take over the country? So it's a, either way, how you reason it, it, it it's just nonsense that that, that that is a central issue for the reason uh, of owning guns. You're not going to be able to hold off the United States with guns. Now, I will say that from a law enforcement standpoint, I think while the conservative wing of America tends to say that they're the ones who are law and order, they support the thin, you know, the, the, the all police lives matter, you know, and all this type of stuff. I think you would find many police officers who would say that the prevalence of guns is a threat to them, yes. um, and and I think that that that's a little bit different story. It's a challenge. So, um, yeah, I that that line of reasoning is is wandering off into the realm of fantasy world. That some yeah. Of those and so are. again, I want to say this really isn't about yeah. the Second Amendment. It's about yeah. your treating the, uh, gun ownership as a fetish, as an idolatry. Yeah. I know the police unions in Ohio oppose stuff that's going on in Ohio. You know, and right. again, here's the other thing. Once your views become extreme, right? Once you have become right. extreme, the experts are the people who know the least. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right? The police yeah. who are out there every day, who know how society functions and works, who know how this stuff happens, they don't know what they're talking about. Right. Um, and so the expert becomes the person who's the most ignorant. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And you see that across a range of issues. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, let's talk a little bit about scripture and Bible because we got to. <laughs> yeah. Do we? All right. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to talk a little bit about. So, OK, Mike. So I. My frustration is the militarization of the gospel. Yes. I listen. I know Christians for centuries have had honest disagreements about when Christians resort to violence, what's acceptable, I get all of that. But I will say this, I do not know how you understand the gospel apart from Jesus's call to nonviolence. Yeah. Now, I don't pretend for a moment that that answers all the difficult questions. But I know one thing for sure, Jesus was never would never have been a gun-toting militaristic messiah uh you saw uh congresswoman lauren bobert's comments recently about jesus died because he didn't have enough ak-47s i mean yeah, yeah yeah you know as you know as someone who studied the scripture for decades who i know i don't know everything for sure and i'm wrong on right. stuff do i really have to respond to that yes yeah and, and it's just it's just so ridiculous that yeah. That, so so here's what I want to say. Here's what I want to say to all my friends, all of our friends, whether you own guns or not, regardless of what you believe about the Second Amendment or not. The reality is the gospel calls us to a peaceful way of life. Right. How we work that out in the trenches is not easy, but that's right. what the gospel calls us to. Right. And oh. yeah, well, yeah. And I, I think what's interesting is you look at um, the, the way that we're going about, the, the way that many of these conservatives are going about trying to change America or change the world, the issue is compliance versus conversion. Mm. Um, what they are attempting is to achieve compliance to a worldview and world order 
that they think needs to exist. And that compliance comes at the barrel of a gun if necessary. Yep. They will yep. achieve compliance. The message of the gospel is, is God could do that at any time that God wanted to. God is all powerful. God could achieve compliance anytime God is ready. But God does not seek compliance. Yes. God seeks yes. conversion. And conversion comes through uh, unmerited grace, through accepting, through self-sacrificial love and denial and service of others. And so when you have Jesus being tempted in the wilderness and Satan says, hey, you're going to be king anyway here. I'll give all this to you if you just bow down to me. That's the temptation that Jesus can bypass the cross, that Jesus can bypass the suffering that he knows he is going to have to encounter in order to achieve that redemption of the world. And he rejects that. And basically, this whole conservative gun culture, rah, rah, let's go shoot them all up if they you know, don't agree with this, is basically failing the temptation in the desert that, oh my that, that Jesus oh my is giving. Good stuff, good stuff. And in fact, as you say that, I have thought uh, over the years that, yeah. that if we could put some of these folks with Jesus in the in the wilderness, when Satan offered him the kingdoms of the world, they would have said, take it, yeah. take it, yeah. right? Take it. Yeah. I mean, what's a little devil worship if you can rule the kingdoms of the world and get what you want, right? right. Yeah. You know, and Jesus says, no, that's not the way this works. This is not the way. It's the old Geico commercial. That's not the way any of this works. And yeah. I wonder, and by the way, before, I'm not just pointing fingers. I'm talking about Bevere, too, who hasn't always figured this out. <laughs> when do we realize that this is just not the way that Jesus has called us to? Right. right? I mean, yeah. I mean, again, you and I can quibble and debate over over the. The, the, the minutia on this, but but I don't I think the gospel is clear. I don't think it gives us any room for debate as to what Jesus right. is trying to instill in us. Right. Yeah, and, and just from the larger perspective, you know more about this than I do. I mean, you you studied biblical studies far more extensive than I have. The whole thing about Jesus at the time that he was is that the people were expecting a revolutionary. Yeah. Who would come with violence and overthrow the Roman Empire. Look, look at Mary's song. Um, you know, when Jesus is born, he will bring down the, the mighty. You know, that, that was the hope that was there. And that was what was so disconcerting about his death on the cross is that he never turned to violence. In the garden, he's there and the, the soldiers come. His supporters pull out swords and start begin to start a fight. He says, no, put away your swords. Heals the guy's ear. Um, yeah, it, it's... It is so central in, in all of the gospel to everything that Jesus teaches that this is not about gaining compliance. It's about gaining conversion. And that's, Absolutely right. that's the part that just, yep. and, and I think the part, it is the part that I just find so disheartening and so troubling and um, has really disappointed me about so many people that I have known is because it feels to, to me like such a betrayal of, yeah. of the gospel and what I thought I was about in terms of my relationship with others that I have partnered with at various times in the past. Yeah. And I, I think that's the part that, that is the most heartbreaking. Um, yeah, I would say, developments. Yeah, for me, me personally, in the last, I'd say, seven to eight years, things have been revealed to me that are very unsavory that I didn't know this before. Now I yeah, know. right. Yeah. So let's uh, talk about another subject here. We're getting closer to time, but let's talk about what I call the Gnostification of the gospel. So uh, Gnosticism in the second and third centuries was this belief that the spirit, the flesh, the physical didn't matter. It was bad. You need to get beyond it. It's the spiritual that what you want. And there were Gnostic Christians who were influenced by this, uh, that the, the, the stuff up there was what was important, not what's here. And I have come to believe there are Gnostic Christians who basically believe what really matters is nothing that happens here. What really matters is Jesus saves my soul for heaven when I die. Right. So yeah. everything else, poverty and justice, well, you know, God's going to, God, you know, what's important is, is, is saving people's souls. Now, I'm all for saving people's souls, right? Right. Right. Um, but it seems to me that that's not what the gospel is about. And when you read the biblical narrative, 
God cares about injustice in the here and now. God cares about poverty. God cares about war and violence. He cares about injustice. I got, I, I was thinking this weekend, so I'll tell you a little story. My, I have a granddaughter, uh, <laughs> five-year-old granddaughter, who when she eats cupcakes, loves to eat the frosting. She doesn't <laughs> eat the cake. She loves the frosting. Okay. So, yeah, that's right. She's a five-year-old. I remember a passage from John Howard Yoder in his book, The Politics of Jesus, where he talks about the gospel of going to heaven when we die. And what, what Yoder says is, that's good. He says, that's great that we get eternity. But he says, you know what? That's the frosting on the cake. That isn't yeah. the cake itself. That isn't right. the substance. That yeah. isn't about justice in this life and peace in this life and, and wholeness in this life. And I think about my granddaughter who just wants the frosting, right? Yeah, and I think right, about yeah. Christians that sometimes we just really want the frosting. We just want to know that when I die, I get to go with Jesus and my loved ones. We don't really want to deal with the substance, the hard substance of the gospel in this world of justice and peace, healing brokenness, and uh, all of this kind of stuff. And that that's, I think that's what hinders us sometimes because we think it's really not about all the violence in the world. It's I get, I die and get to go be, be with Jesus. Well, that's clearly right. not what Jesus was about. Right. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think that that's been one of the, without getting too deep into church history and, and. You know, oh, get deep into church, church history. Yeah. <laughs> well, history I, I, is I, wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Well, I, I think about more recent church history, my lifetime and shortly before but the whole rise of evangelicalism from the late 1940s going forward, Billy Graham, you know, some of those kind of things, was an attempt to try to create sort of a, I would call it a, a watered down, uh, er, unite everybody around one idea, which is the idea of saving souls. And all else was lost apart from that. What I find interesting is, is that I think Graham in his later years began to uh, repent from some of that. I, I think he saw where some of this the, this was going, but it has created that sense, the idea of simply personal salvation, and that the way that you uh, redeem the world is that you get everybody personally redeemed, and that will magically uh, solve all the, the problems that are there. Well, there's the principalities and the powers. It, the scripture talks about those repeatedly, that there are systemic things that have been created by humanity that simply... Uh, picking off people one by one and having them become Christians doesn't address those issues. And part of the way that we give evidence of the kingdom that is to come, that God is going to create, is by advocating for those values and for those realities here in the present. We, we, we live the, I don't know, what's the term I heard somebody use one time? We, we live the future in the present yes. as, as the church. Um, and I think it was Scott McKnight who, who used the idea that we are citizens of another kingdom. And the best way to view ourselves as ambassadors of that other kingdom, and each church is an embassy uh, for, for that kingdom. And so while we are part of the community that we are in, we're never wholly a part of that community. Um, we, are, we are to be representing and living and articulating a different world and calling people to that. So it's not just about personal salvation, it's a call to be in a different way, both individually and corporately, um, and advocating for that. I, I don't see how you can, well, I do see how you can do it because it's happened, but it, it's hard for me to understand how people miss that reading scripture. Um, yeah. I appreciate that. Hey, by the way, you know what we should do in an episode, a feature episode, is we should have Scott on, two of us can quiz him, with them, right? there you go. three of us yeah we'll kind of give him yeah okay we'll have to do that but listen michael i completely agree with that my so i've seen memes on facebook i know you have too it says we don't have a sin pro a gun problem we have a sin problem and yeah my huge frustration with that is that it again removes the issue of sin from the substance of our sins Right, so, yeah. you know, the, the prophets are always clear. They don't speak of sin abstractly. Right. Uh, and John the Baptist, when he is asked, you know, when he, he tells everybody to repent and they say, what should we do? He doesn't say stop sinning. 
He says, here's what you should do. Don't take more pay than you should. Don't swindle people, right? right. He's very specific. And so I want to say, when people say that, I want to say, wait a minute, stop. Yes, we have a specific a sin problem. It's a gun problem. It's people yes. who use guns and worship them and who then, who even though they're well-intentioned, I don't question their intentions, mm -hmm. even though they're well-intentioned, support things that continue to allow people to shoot up schools. I mean, yeah. that's, that's the concern that I have. Right. Well, and if you, you look at um, suicides, I mean, there, there are more suicides by guns than there are murders by guns. Um, and I, I think one of the things that, uh, that happens, particularly with suicide, and I think it's probably happens with many murders, it's impulsive. Um, you, you, you didn't plan. Uh, many people who commit suicide, it's at a moment of weakness, of desperation, they, they, they feel lost. If they could get past that moment, maybe an hour or two past that moment sometimes, they would be back in a more uh, stable state where, where they would not have killed themselves. And what attempts, they, if they didn't have a gun, what attempts that they might make to kill themselves generally would not be as effective and often could be, uh, they could be rescued from that suicide. When you have a gun, it's pretty final. Um, and so when you easy, easy, yeah, oh yeah, easy. That's what it, it, it's easy and it's it's final. It's very effective. And so the prevalence of guns, just having guns everywhere, simply um, facilitates that human weakness that so many of us have of either despair or anger uh, in, in those situations. So yeah, it, it's a it's a sin problem, but there's no reason why we need to facilitate the sin. Uh. <laughs> right. You know, listen, listen, if if it's been proven that my next door neighbor has real psychological, emotional issues, why right. would anyone want to give that guy a gun? That's my right. question. Right. Right. Yeah. And yeah. so this is what bothers me. Hey, Michael, we need to talk about uh, back up a little bit. Talk about one more issue okay. that I wanted to touch upon for your thoughts. So often I hear the argument. That well, Chicago has gun laws, and that hasn't mitigated, you know, uh, uh, gun crime in Chicago. Okay, fair enough. Okay, but I don't think that's a valid argument, and I'm going to express my views on that in a minute. So, what happens? What do you? How, what's your response to somebody who says, "Well, Chicago has strict gun laws, and you know, they're still shooting people." Uh, so obviously, uh, uh, federal gun laws are not going to help. What's your response yes. to that? Well, again, that goes back to the thing that we were talking about earlier. It, it may put um, the fact that, that a particular policy doesn't fully eliminate a problem doesn't mean that the policy is useless yeah. or worthless. It means that it may put one curve on it. As I recall, Chicago is not the top 10 of the most violent cities in, in America. Oh, don't it, confuse it, us with the facts. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, uh, Kansas City is, uh, okay. has the worst crime rate than, than at the rate of crime has a worse crime rate, worse murder rate than Chicago does. Yeah. Um, and we don't have those gun laws. Uh, so how do you want to, you know, if you're talking about rates of gun control. So uh, yeah, that just kind of, uh, um, no, it didn't stop it, but did it curtail it? How much, yeah. how much did it curtail? Those are always hard to, to quantify. It's, it's hard to quantify that, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So for me, part of the issue is, is that City and state borders are not uh, exactly what what's the word I want? They're they're not uh, secure borders. So you know, I drive to Cleveland to go to a Guardians game, and I drive by, and it says "Welcome to Cleveland" or yeah. "Welcome to Ohio." When I come up through West Virginia into Marietta, these yeah. are not secure borders. And so when someone says Chicago, well, you know, I can buy a gun in Ohio now. I don't even need to have a permit. Right. I can buy a gun in Ohio and drive to Chicago. And yeah. so uh, this is this is not an issue of, of uh, the problem is that we're not dealing with secure borders. You know, if Chicago wants right. to put should put uh, yes. armed guards at every at every entrance yeah. And, yeah. and search cars, that's one thing. But that that's not going to yeah. happen. Well, and I, I saw somebody recently post this thing about, you know, if you live like 135th Street in South Chicago. Uh, and I can't remember what the North South Street they has. It's literally, you know, like a two mile drive over to Indiana 
into yeah. to, to, to guy talks about he goes there all the time to get his gas because he likes the convenience store that's over there so you're, you're yeah. in, living in chicago but you're right next door to indiana and indiana doesn't have the same laws and like you said it's a forest border so yeah it, it's not fully effective um and so the argument is really i think for a federal response yeah right this. Uh, yeah. And you and I are both, let's say this again for the record, you and I are both tend to be, uh, we tend to be federalists. Yep. We like uh, giving stuff over to the states. Yes, we do. But we also know there are some things that now nah, we can't leave to the states. Right. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Well, Michael, we're getting to time. Do you have any other thoughts for us for the good of the order? Oh, I don't know particularly. This is a this is an issue that I find particularly difficult because yeah. there, there is there is no to use a term silver bullet. Uh, there is no silver silver bullet solution to to the gun control uh, or I shouldn't say gun control gun safety uh, gun safety issues. The issue is how to live as a as a more peaceful society. Yeah. Uh, I, I the rancor in this this goes with a lot of issues. We know that politicians have with gun control, with immigration, with abortion. The issue is not to solve the problem. The issue itself is what is useful in terms what of policy. Yeah. And, and how do we as the church bear witness to that? This is the one thing I keep right. saying time and time again. I do not care if you want a gun or not. Right. The reality is that we believe that the gospel is offering reconciliation and as a follower of Jesus, I am more concerned with bringing people together right. than the Second Amendment. And by the right. way, as somebody who believes in free speech, uh, yeah. I am more concerned about, again, bringing people together than the First Amendment. And it, yeah. it becomes, you know, for me, it becomes an issue of what matters most to you. Right. Do you when you hear these kinds of conversations, okay, when you hear this stuff about guns, etc. Do you think about first the Second Amendment or do you think about what would Jesus promote? Yeah. Right. That's that and by the way, I'm not saying but uh, that if you ask that second question, we'll all agree. I'm right. just simply saying that what's our posture? By the way, that's a book, that's my first book in retirement. What's the yeah. posture of yeah. Christians on these issues? And so right. We right. might not agree, but can we agree that we start at the same place? That's my right. dilemma. Yeah, and, I, and that's where I get the, I think the point that I would go to there on a whole range of issues, not just the, the gun debate, yeah. is that politicians keep these issues alive because it's useful to them politically to get people riled up in order to uh, metastasize them to a particular hardcore ideology that they want to promote. As Christians, whether you're liberal, conservative, whatever, that cannot be your agenda if you are truly trying to live out as a disciple of Christ. And it requires resistance to that political attempt to, to try to do that. Um, so, yeah, that, I guess that you're was- You're speaking my language, Michael. Politicians are not interested in solving our problems. They're interested in ginning up their base so they can get reelected. Let's be yeah. honest about it. Yeah, that's right. Republican yeah. and Democrat. I don't care about the party. Yeah, that's their job. They want yeah. to make you. And let me also say, so I can get this in, the shock jocks and evening cable news and radio are not interested yeah. in truth. They're interested in keeping us angry, so yeah. that we'll come and view them tomorrow night to keep us angry, so yeah. that the ratings will remain high. Yeah. So, to quote a, uh, a turn of a phrase on St. Paul. We believers should have nothing to do with this. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Is exactly. that my sermon? Should I take an offering, Michael? I don't know. <laughs> there you go. I've got a plug here somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, we're going to end there. Michael, I am always grateful for your insights and uh, just uh, just appreciate the conversation that we have. So, uh, Likewise. Any, any, anything that you want to say other than... Uh, I continue to pray for the Royals. <laughs> I, I, I was going to say, as futile as it is, let's go Royals. <laughs> God, answer my prayers, even though I know there's no hope. <laughs> oh, that's right. Exactly. Yeah, listen, I'm with you, my friend. I keep, I keep saying, now that I'm retired, someday 
I'm going to come out to Kansas City when the Indian or the Guardians, I got to say the yeah. Guardians, are playing the Royals, and you and I are going to catch a game together. And, and, and vice versa. Uh, and of course, since I'll be in my Guardians garb, I will count you to protect me. <laughs> <laughs> it will work. Kansas City loves all baseball. Uh, listen, I, I have no doubt that the folks in Kansas City are good folks. So I'll, I'm sure I'll be among yeah. good people. Friends, thank you for joining us today. This is Faith Seeking Understanding University and our episode of Calmly Considered. And I, uh, our patron saint here is the Anselm of Canterbury, uh, at, at, uh, who said, I do not seek to understand that I may believe, but I believe in order to understand Friends, please keep seeking. Have a good day. Take care. Bye-bye.